Join us at Walters on Friday, October 4th for our end of season podcast party. Evening is scheduled from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Here it is. Sweet a ground ball toward the hole. It's a base hit in the right field. Two runs are going to score. Gallo's throw home is cut off by the pitcher Salazar. Corner scores. Crow Armstrong scores. Two run pinch hit single for Talkman. And the Cubs now lead it three to nothing. And welcome to Nats Chat for Saturday, September 21st, 2024, what is the final full day of summer in this year of 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who is in Chicago. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. The Nationals now are a season-worst 18 games below 500 and now have a five-game losing streak. Friday afternoon, a 3-1 loss at the Chicago Cubs in Game 2 of a four-game series. That's now 68-86. and 86. Must go at least four and four over their final eight games in order to surpass last regular season's record of 71 and 91. We have gone from the Nats surpassing 71 wins, appearing to be very likely, to now, dare I say, more unlikely than likely? Question mark. We can debate that, but uh, it has become a conversation. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Capo's Deli. Make sure to check out its location at Nationals Park in Section 136 near the Nationals bullpen. The Nats' recent losing is not good. But we on Friday afternoon did have two very good things for the Nats. A, left fielder James Wood homered, uh, and this was a mammoth homer. That was the Nats' only run in the game, but that was an impressive home run. And of course, good to see James Wood elevate a ball and homer. And B, starting pitcher Trevor Williams was excellent in his first major league start in nearly four months. Mark, we on the last installment of the podcast joked about how we had no idea what to expect from Williams in this game. He was so impressive. I give him a lot of credit. He picked up right where he left off in late May. This was really impressive. I think as we said, and I think everybody out there would have to acknowledge, you really had no idea what was going to happen when he took the mound at Wrigley Field. And to be honest, watching it, it looked like the exact same guy that we saw in April and May. And I mean that in the most positive way possible. He was sharp. He was throwing strikes. He was getting swings and misses. He had seven strikeouts in five innings. He made one bad pitch that resulted in a solo homer in the first. And otherwise, he was really, really good. And under some different circumstances, he probably goes deeper in the game. But in his first start back after almost four months out, you're not going to push him beyond that. And so while I understand that it may not be the most important thing for him or the t- certainly for the team in the long run, I think there was value in doing this. It's giving him some peace of mind as he prepares for an offseason in which he doesn't know where he's going to be playing next year. And maybe it gives the Nationals a little bit of sense of, okay, if we had thoughts of bringing him back, you wanted to see some evidence that what he did in April and May wasn't a complete fluke. And based on what we saw in this game, it was not a fluke. This looks legit. This was his first major league start since May 30th. The Nats on Friday afternoon officially announced having reinstated Williams from the 60-day injured list. He had been on that since September 1st due to his right flexor muscle strain. He was on the 15-day injured list from June 4th retroactive to June 1st until September 1st. He missed a lot of time with this injury, no doubt. And like Mark said, Williams was just so good in this game. One run, five innings, seven strikeouts, no walks. Gave up just three hits, which were a home run and two singles. Pumped strikes, 66 pitches, 46 strikes versus just 20 balls. And was highly pitch efficient. Five innings, 66 pitches. How many times this season have we seen a guy throw five innings and, you know, it takes like 80 pitches, maybe even 90 pitches. This guy was moving things along, really did a good job. And, you know, to whatever extent there is that chance of the Nats resigning him this offseason, you should never base any decision on just two days, two outings, two starts. But I do think it maybe does kind of matter how he performs over these final two starts here. He pitched on Friday afternoon. Presumably, he'll make one more start. If he looks really good in that next start, I would think that that does help to build the case for, hey, if he's willing to come back here and maybe be a long man, you know, number six type starter. And is it going to cost a lot? Maybe there is uh, some merit to that line of thinking from a Nationals perspective to bring them back to add to your inventory of pitching for next season. Yeah. And I do think these two starts matter, not in a vacuum. If this were the only two starts you were seeing of him, you don't want to put too much stock in them. But as we said, because they got two months worth of him in April and May that were really good, 
such night and day difference from last year when he was, you know, along with Patrick Corbin, one of the worst starters in baseball. So you get those first two months and we were saying throughout it all, is this legitimate? Is Has he resurrected his career? Could he actually do this over the long haul? And then we didn't get to find that out because he got hurt and missed all that time. So while a couple starts maybe isn't going to give you a hundred percent peace of mind there, I think it gives you a good amount, especially, as I said, it's not just what the results were, but he looked like the same guy. The velocity was right where it was last time, 88 to 90, really good breaking ball, keeping everything down in the zone, didn't walk anybody. Like I said, gave up the one home run. That was only the third home run he's given up all year. That was such a big factor in his improvement this year and the efficiency. So, I mean, you put it all together and, you know, again, if he's healthier, in that role, maybe you extend him a little bit further. But we knew even when he was healthy in the first two months of the season, they very often said, no, give us two times through the lineup, five innings, 80 pitches tops, and we're good to go. There's value in that. And so for the fact that he could just step right in after that long layoff and basically be the exact same pitcher, I do think that matters as they try to make that decision of, do we want to try to bring him back or not? The great mystery of this season with Trevor Williams is, had he not gotten hurt, Would he have continued to be good or would he have faded as he did last season? It's important to remember Trevor Williams' first 11 starts last regular season, ERA 393. He then completely fell apart over June, July, August, and September, ended with an ERA of 555 and a whip of 160. Would something similar to that, even along those lines, have happened this season? Or was he, in fact, fixed for this season? Because if the latter is the case, That is extremely encouraging, not just for Trevor Williams, but from a Nationals perspective. If Jim Hickey and Sean Doolittle were able to figure this out to where they got Trevor Williams to be good, you know, and and look, is he like under three ERA good? No, but to be a good, legitimate starting pitcher, that is extremely (laughs) encouraging in this Nats rebuild. We just can't answer that question. But I tell you, an outing like this on Friday afternoon does make you kind of wonder, this new coaching pairing when it comes to pitchers of Hickey and Doolittle. Do the Nats really have something here in these two? And did they maybe fix Trevor Williams? And if so, who else might they be able to fix? So they were giving credit to those two guys in the first two months of the year for helping Williams. And it wasn't just that he was going about pitching the exact same way and was just having much better results. As I said, recognizing things needed to be down at the knees or below in all cases. The breaking ball being a little bit different and a little bit sharper, relying on a little bit different repertoire, getting swings and misses and strikeouts. Okay. That's a big difference from who he was. It's not just about soft contact. It's actually about getting swings and misses. And the biggest thing, as I said, keeping the ball in the yard. He gave up 34 homers last year. Most of the majors have given up three in 50 something innings. I think this year, maybe he's over 60 innings now with this start. So I do think that is a product of some changes that he made along with Doolittle and Hickey helping him out. And whether he's back here or whether he goes somewhere else, I think there is some reason to believe that he can uh, turn a corner, that he already has turned a corner and can duplicate this to some extent. Now, what you said about the way he wore down last year, I do think that's a legitimate concern. And so I think that's why if you bring him back, you're not looking at him as a full-time starter. You're not asking for 150 innings out of him in 2025. I think the key there is to limit the amount. He's sort of that if we need a fifth starter guy, but if not, we know he's been successful as a long reliever. We've talked about this year how they were lacking that guy and could really use someone like that when a starter does get knocked out early. I think there's a place for something like that on next year's pitching staff. It shouldn't cost a whole lot, I wouldn't think. And Maybe you get the best out of Trevor Williams when you know going into it, we're probably talking about 100 innings max and ideally even less than that if they've got five better starters and don't need him to be a regular in the rotation. And that had been essentially what he was prior to coming to the Nets, a guy who was a combo starter reliever, a guy who could be used that way and be effective in that way. You go back to the 2022 regular season, Williams for the New York Mets, 89 and two-thirds innings over 30 games, including nine starts. So not a lot of starts. You would probably, you would think he would make more than nine starts for the Nats next year. But then again, maybe not, maybe not. But 89 and two-thirds innings, ERA of 321. 
So he was good for the Mets in 2022, and maybe that's the way the Nats should be viewing him for 2025. Now, would he be willing to resign with the Nats, or would he be seeking a full-time starter's role? That would be something that I would wonder. So my sense was when the Nats signed him, his motivation in particular for coming to this team, which let's be clear, was coming off a hundred something, 107 loss season, whatever it was in 2022. Why did he sign with them? Why did he leave the Mets for that? It was the two-year deal, number one, and it was also the promise of being a full-time starter because he felt like he could do that and that you know he really wanted to show he's still a big league starter. So they gave him that opportunity that maybe others didn't. I don't know, and he's not saying right now, if that is still the motivation, the primary motivation for him moving forward, or would he look at the situation and say, these guys have been good to me. They stuck with me through this injury. They helped me turn things around after an awful 2023. Even if the role isn't exactly what I would hope it would be, maybe I can contribute and be effective on a team that potentially is getting better as opposed to signing on as a full-time starter with a team that's expected to be really bad next year. So I think those are the factors he's going to have to weigh in his mind. If he comes to the right place mentally, I think there's a legitimate argument for it. If you are a fan of Vampire Weekend, then Game Time is your spot. They are performing at the Anthem on September 30th and October 1st, just after the Nats season wraps up. Game Time is proud of their ticket coverage. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. They also offer a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. What's up, everybody? It's Heisman Trophy winner Matt Leiner. I've got a podcast called Throwbacks with actor Jay Farrar where we'll be talking all things sports, but also so much more. We'll give you the the behind-the-scenes stories from my days as the quarterback on an iconic college football team to Jerry's days as a star on an iconic TV series. So subscribe to Throwbacks wherever you download your podcasts and follow us on all social media at Throwback Show. Next pitch, swung on, hit a mile high to right. Way back, Bellinger looking up, going, going, and gone. Goodbye. About three rows from the top of the bleachers in straightaway right field. Bang, zoom, goes James Wood to get the Nationals on the board. Home run number eight, RBI number 39. And that was a blast by James Wood. And it is now the Cubs three and the Nationals one. Well, the corresponding roster move to the Nats activating Trevor Williams on Friday afternoon was them optioning reliever Zach Brixey to AAA Rochester. So what we suspected might be the corresponding move was in fact the move. Four Nats relievers in this 3-1 loss at the Cubs on Friday afternoon combined to allow two runs in three innings. Robert Garcia, a perfect bottom of the sixth. Eduardo Salazar allowed two runs in two-thirds of an inning. Bottom of the seventh, he allowed uh, two runs, gave up three singles, and issued a walk into wild pitch, all with two outs. One of the two out singles was an infield single by Pete Crow Armstrong and a grounder up the middle on an 0-2 pitch. Uh, Second baseman Darren Baker, who, yes, was the Nats starting second baseman for a second consecutive game, failed in an attempt at a sliding backhanded catch of that grounder. That was a tough play. Would have liked to have seen Baker make it, but again, not an easy play. Tanner Rainey faced four batters, got three outs. Joe LaSorsa faced one batter, got one out. So Garcia, Rainey, and LaSorsa were good. Salazar, not so much. And again, What was so odd about Salazar's outing, first two guys he retires, and then everything kind of fell apart in that inning. And it shows you how slim the margin is there. He's one pitch away from getting out of that with no damage, and you issue a two-out walk, which is never a good thing. As you said, the infield single on a play that I guess it's the right call, but there's a case we made that you could at least consider an error on Baker on that one. And I have to say, while he's been very good at the plate, what we've seen from him, In the field, it hasn't been anything that spectacular so far. A couple of plays that he could have made that he didn't. So there's that. A wild pitch obviously makes it worse. And then a ground ball single through the right side. Now, here's my thing with that inning. I would have liked to see Tanner Rainey get that inning in a 1-0 game. 
he came in after the fact. It's already three nothing now. It's not a high leverage spot anymore. We've talked about how much improvement Rainey has shown over the second half of the season. And I get it. You don't want to mess things up when they're going well. You want to be able to go in the offseason feeling good about himself, all that stuff. But man, I'd like to see him in a situation of more consequence. And that felt like a good one to do it in. And by the time he came into the game, it was kind of too late. And he wound up being good, but it didn't matter as much because they're down three runs at that point. So I really hope over these final eight games, we get to see Rainey in a situation of more consequence. I think it would be nice to see that and get a better sense as you prepare for the offseason of whether he can be that guy again. There's nothing to lose at this point. So to me, you should be open to trying anything. They do seem to think that there's something potentially there with Salazar. So maybe they're like, hey, we rather use a developmental opportunity for Salazar than Rainey. Uh, but yeah, the way Rainey has been going, you certainly could make that case that he deserved to be in that spot. Well, look, whatever happened with the Nats bullpen in this game, hard to win when you score one run. And uh, that's what happened with the Nats on Friday afternoon. The offense was so good on Thursday night. We talked about that on the last installment of the podcast. But the Nats in this game, one run, five hits, three walks, but 0 for 4 with runners in scoring position. The five hits were comprised of a home run and four singles, two of which were bunt singles to tell you (laughs) what was going on with the Nats offensively in this game. Now, you can take solace in the homer being from James Wood. And, you know, not that that like makes the uh, bad offensive output okay, but sometimes when the who is a particularly good who, it does make you feel a little bit better. And it was really good to see James Wood homer as he did. So Wood in this game as an ad starting left fielder and number three batter, one for three, solo homer and a walk, another walk. The plate discipline continues to be on display. Wood in the top of the first, a two out, six pitch walk. And the homer came in the eighth inning, a one run eight for the Nats, a leadoff homer on a bomb to right field to cut the Nats deficit to 3-1. The homer per stat cast going a projected 421 feet, exit velocity of 109 miles per hour, highest exit velocity of the game. More of that, please. We all know the deal with James Wood. Elevate more. When he does elevate, it is a thing of beauty. That was an impressive home run. A great swing, great contact, pulled the ball, drove it, no doubter, like three rows from clearing the bleachers in right field. And oh, by the way, the wind was blowing in (laughs) from right field. It was kind of a weird day. We changed directions a few times, but at that moment, it was blowing in. For him to do that under those conditions was fantastic. You wish there was somebody on base or multiple guys on base at that time, but it's good to see that it is in there. We know it's in there. He found the right pitch, a breaking ball to do that with. And when you combine the patience, as we've talked about, with the ability to hit a baseball like that, it's something special. And, you know, all the talk around baseball the last 24 hours have been about Shohei Otani and being the first ever to go 50 50. And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but. If you want a guy with a skill set that has the ability to do that, it's James Wood. He's got a long way to go, so I don't even want to go deep into that conversation. But you do see, and we have seen over the last almost three months in the big leagues, that he possesses a power and speed combo in addition to a great eye at the plate that gives him the potential to really do it all as a hitter. At the very least, 30-30. I mean, he has certainly that capability. You know, I was looking at this today. The Nats so need to get back to having someone hit 30 home runs. A Nationals player has not hit 30 homers in a regular season since 2019 when Juan Soto and Anthony Rendon did that. Now, Lane Thomas actually came closer than people may think, 28 last regular season. But like, it is so time to get back to that. I mean, 30 homers is a really good total Obviously, it does happen a decent amount. Like it, it's not you know unheard of for a guy to get to thirty homers. It's been a while since someone did that for the Nats. Clearly, James Wood has that kind of potential and uh, some really good stuff from him over the first two games of the series. But yeah, beyond James Wood homering, just not a lot happening in this game. Darren Baker had a bunt single. Gets on base again. Good for him. Drew Millis, who was an ad starting catcher, bunt single. Good for him to see that. Kate Ruiz had a single. Just not a lot going on. I did want to bring up Dylan Cruz, another hitless game for him. So he was an ad starting center fielder with Jacob Young not playing, although there does appear at least some mildly encouraging news with his shoulder. We can get to that. Uh, but Cruz in this game is an ad starting center fielder, number two batter, 0 for 3. Did draw a walk, top of the third, a one out five pitch walk. But you know, Cruz did not partake in the uh, offensive festivities in the uh, 7-6 loss on Thursday night. Cruz in that game 0 for 5 
with two strikeouts. His OPS at the major league level here since being promoted to the majors is at 621. You wrote a bit about him in your uh, game story on MassInSports.com. Look, nobody's panicking over Dylan Cruz, but it has not been great here these last few weeks with him. Right. And what's so obvious is how he's getting pitched. He's just not getting fastballs. He had bat in this game, bases loaded, two outs, and he gets three straight breaking balls. Two of them were out of the zone. He took one, he fouled off another, and then he swung through the third one. And this is unfortunately what's going to be the case for him until he proves that he can either lay off those pitches and draw walks or find the right ones to do some damage on When you come in with such a reputation as he does, and same thing with James Wood to an extent, pitchers know it. They're not going to give in to you. They know your ability and they say, okay, this kid reached the big leagues at such a young age and so quickly out of college. Why? Because he probably kills fastballs. Well, he maybe saw breaking balls at LSU, but he didn't see big league breaking balls. And so we're going to keep giving him a steady diet of it until he proves that he can handle it. And that's what's going on with him right now. I don't doubt that in the long run, he's going to figure it out. He's too talented. He's too driven. He's had success everywhere he's ever played before. I don't think it's going to be an issue for him in the long run, but it is a growing pain and something he's going to have to figure out. Hopefully, you see some signs of it here over the final week of the season. If not, it's going to be a big point emphasis, I think, going into next year for him as you hope he takes that next big step and and shows that he can be the kind of superstar player they all expect him to be. Hey, Nat Shet, I want to tell you about Mint Mobile's premium wireless package starting at $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash natschat. That's mintmobile.com slash natschat. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash natschat. $45 upfront payment required. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigs on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Swanson swings, drives, going to deep left center field. Back is Cruz at the wall, looking up, and it is gone. A line shot over the 368-foot marker, and Dansby Swanson has hit his 16th home run of the year. He got hold of a a changeup at 82 miles an hour and hammered at 389 feet is their estimated distance. They lead at Chicago 1 and Washington nothing. A game like this loss on Friday afternoon is another reminder of the Nats' need for more offense. And we do anticipate this offseason that being a primary target for the team. Offense, a big bat, perhaps a first baseman. Nats president of baseball operations and general manager Mike Rizzo actually just did an interview with MLB.com. He spoke with Bill Ladson, uh, who, of course, covered the Nationals for years. And Bill asked Mike about the Nats potentially signing a big bat this offseason. I'll just read you a brief portion of the interview. So the question, do you see the team signing a Jason Worth type of veteran who can help the young players grow and win a lot of games like the team did starting in 2012? Rizzo's answer, I think we need to improve ourselves in any avenue we can. Free agency certainly will be one of the avenues that will attack to improve. Also, we have to look at the trade market and the development market. We have to be hitting on all of those cylinders to get us where we want to go. Question, are you looking for a first baseman? Rizzo, I wouldn't keyhole us at first base. We need some offense. We need a couple of bats that can hit in the middle of the lineup and take the onus off some of these good young core players and assist them in the run creation of our offense. We have the core players to be middle of the lineup hitters. If we add a bat or two into that group, it takes a little bit of pressure off everybody and everybody can relax a little bit more and develop into the players we think they are going to be. So, you know, there's a lot to parse through there. And obviously Rizzo isn't going to say much. There is, though, a wild card looming over all of this, and that is, what is Mike Rizzo going to be allowed to do this offseason? What kind of a budget is he going to be given from ownership? How in are the learners when it comes to spending to improve the team? When it comes to when a decision like that is made, the budget for the offseason, do you think that's something that's being determined now? 
Do you think that that's something that isn't determined until after the end of the Nats season? Do you think there have maybe been general conversations between Mike Rizzo and ownership? Because this, as much as anything, is, is what's going to matter here. What is Mike Rizzo allowed to do this offseason? There's a lot here we don't know. Where do you think we might be when it comes to what the budget for Rizzo this offseason is going to be? So my sense has always been that those kind of discussions happen after the season is over and that Rizzo and his staff start to prepare different scenarios based on different potential budgets. And they kind of have the, hey, here's the dream one, dream scenario if we have an unlimited budget and go go out and sign Max Scherzer and uh, those kind of guys. And then here's plan B, which is like the second level. And you say, okay, we can't spend a fortune, but we can go get Adam LaRoche. We can go get Annabelle Sanchez, those kind of guys. And then there's plan C, which is what the last few years have been, which is go find the cheapest team you can possibly put together. And you end up with these reclamation projects that you hope pan out and do well for you on a tight budget. And maybe you flip them at the trade deadline. And then you also understand that it may not work out at all for you. So I don't know that anybody outside of the Lerner family themselves knows the answer to that question. I do know from talking to people that the front office has been targeting this winter as the time to go for it. That's been the case for a while. There was some consideration last winter and the feeling, even from a baseball standpoint, was we're not quite there yet. Whether they gave us the budget or not, we need to use one more year to really get these kids up in the big leagues and then find out what do we have, what do we still need, and that the market next winter looked pretty good, especially on the pitching front, which at the time I think was a larger concern for them. So I think from a front office standpoint, they believe the time has come to spend money. I also know that there are people in the organization that are very skeptical whether they will be allowed to do it or not. Now, they're just probably basing that off of recent history. I don't know that anybody has heard it directly from ownership that that's the case. I don't know that conversation has truly happened yet or that word has trickled down to everyone in the organization. But there is legitimate skepticism in some corners of the organization over whether Ownership will say, yes, go back to being the big budget nationals of the 2010s and instead of the you know medium to lower budget nationals of the 2020s. And this is the number one question of the offseason. Now, it's possible for them to improve without spending huge dollars on free agents. I think it's interesting that Rizzo in one of those answers mentioned the trade market. I think that is absolutely an avenue that they look at. And for the first time in a while, they're in a position to trade some prospect capital in exchange for big leaguers who could help them. I think that's something to keep an eye on this winter. So it is possible to improve without spending a ton, but Mike Rizzo would much rather have a blank check to go sign whoever he thinks can help this team the most. And it's going to be at least a little while until we know the answer. I think it's a huge issue. And when it comes to what is the most significant thing happening with the Nats over the next few weeks, honestly, the answer is what is Mike Rizzo going to be allowed to do? You know, what is being determined when it comes to the offseason budget? And we're not going to know when that determination happens. We're not going to know what that determination is because Mike Rizzo, the next time he talks to you guys, whenever that is, is going to give you that stock answer of, well, the learners allow me to field a competitive team or whatever it is, right? He said that many times. That's what he should say. He should not be airing, you know, dirty laundry out for the public. Absolutely not. But yeah, I think this is a really big deal. What is happening behind the scenes when it comes to conversations between baseball operations for the Nats and ownership of the Nats? And of course, this all goes back to how in ownership is on owning the team. We don't know. There's a lot here we don't know. April 11th, 2022 was when we learned that the learners had begun exploring selling the Nats. This past February 19th, President's Day, was when we learned that the learners were no longer exploring selling the Nats. But of course, you can no longer be exploring selling the team, but you can still be wanting to sell the team. You can be at a point at which you're not really wanting to own the team. And to further complicate things, when we say learners, right, it's not just Mark Lerner who is the managing principal owner. It is Mark Lerner and various other people. And the word has been that when it came to selling the team, not everyone was on the same page. Some wanted to keep the team. Others did not. Who stood where? We don't know. But, you know, if those who did not want to keep the team don't want to spend this offseason, you wonder how that might impact what Mike Rizzo is allowed to do. So, again, a lot we don't know, but a lot here that matters a lot. And uh, I think that's a fascinating storyline here. You know, 
we can get on Rizzo for what he does and doesn't do. What we never know is what is he allowed to do? To what extent is he handcuffed? And we'll just have to wait and see. And I guess the proof will be in the action. The proof will be in what does go down uh, this coming off season. Yeah. And the thing is, as you kind of alluded to there, there's not going to be a declaration like, hey, we're back. We're all in this winter. It's going to come out through whatever their actions are. And that can both be the actual signings, if there are any, but it can also be, you know, as rumors start to get out who they're pursuing. If they're all in on Juan Soto, that tells you a little bit something there. If they're all in on some other names that come up, uh, Pete Alonzo, uh, Max Fried, Corbin Burns, guys like that, you'd say, okay, they sound like they're serious, even if they don't ultimately end up signing these guys. At least you have a sense of that. But it really won't be until the end of the winter when you see what the finished product is, because they could make lesser moves in December and January, but all of a sudden somebody's out there unsigned, unavailable, and you know ownership says, yeah, go for it. And they sign somebody to a nine-figure contract. We're just not going to know until it's all said and done this winter. And that's frustrating for everyone because you just want to know what is the plan? How is this proceeding? Are they ready to take that next step in this very long process that in a lot of ways has gone uh, sort of how they wanted it to in terms of the teardown and the rebuild? Like They've got the kids now at the big league level that they got in these trades and through their high draft picks. And now the next step in the equation is supplementing that with experienced big leaguers who can take you to the next level. Check back on the first day of spring training, I guess, and we'll see what the roster looks like. I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody truly knows the answer. It could go one of two ways or even one of like three different ways. Like I said, it could be all in, it could be somewhere in the middle, and it can be, you know, 2023, 2024 all over again. Nationals ownership for those who don't know, so Mark Lerner is the managing principal owner, and then there are six people who are listed as principal owners, Annette M. Lerner, Marla Lerner-Tannenbaum, Deborah Lerner-Cohen, Robert K. Tannenbaum, Edward L. Cohen, Judy Lenkin Lerner. Again, who stands where? Who wants what? We don't know. It's like an episode of Succession or House of Cards, you know, like what are those conversations like behind the scenes? Wouldn't you love to know? Wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall when ownership gathers and discusses what should we do? What will we do uh, this coming off season? This installment of the Nat Chat podcast brought to us by Capo's Deli. Make sure to check out its location at Nationals Park in Section 136 near the Nationals bullpen. Hit us up on X. You tell us what you think. Find us at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show, NatsChatPodcast at gmail.com. We have a website you can check out as well, NatsChatPodcast.com, in which you can purchase a Nats Chat podcast t-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. Game three for the Nats at the Cubs Saturday afternoon at 2.20. Mackenzie Gore will be the Nats starting pitcher. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. I mean, it makes us look weak. No, it makes us look ruthless. And actually, I do know what I'm f- talking about. Dad, what the fuck are we doing? Show me the bloat anywhere else in this company. Where is it? You show me. Show me the waste that we're letting these f- get away with. Fine, so we restructure them and we grow I think them if we don't shutter it, vertical. then we gut it. We carve that sh- like a pumpkin. Huh. You hive off the profit center, you keep the domain name, the archive. Um, gut level, Dad, this thing is not coming back. Dad, Walter can be our lodestar. This, is, this isn't the time to retreat. Your brother's right. Got it. Okay.